So Matt, welcome to MOOC++. We're very much looking forward to learn what you have to say about uh, the compiler's ability to help us. And also, in addition, we are very happy to give you the opportunity to prove that you're more than just an occasional verb. <laughs> Thank you here tonight. Thank you so much, Klaus. Yeah, um, well, I know my, my last name has definitely uh, given me a lot of notoriety, but uh, uh, hopefully, yeah, you'll give me the opportunity to uh, uh, give, say that there is more, than, more to me than just the website. So um, let's, get a, let's get started. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, some of the cool things that your compiler does for you that perhaps you don't understand or don't know uh, is going on. So oh, hang on, if I can press, there we are. All right. So first of all, hello, everybody. As Klaus says, I have be accidentally become a verb. Um, who knew that hosting a website under your own vanity domain would uh, cause so many troubles down the line and so many opportunities as well, I should say. Obviously. Um, I think you probably know that this site exists and we're going to be looking at some of the things that it can do for us uh, during this presentation. But this is when my life changed when I published what was originally GCC Explorer and soon became Compiler Explorer, which is a site that lets you look at how the compiler sees your code and how the uh, assembly code gets generated. So the first and only thing you need to know about this whole talk is compilers are amazing. They're a fantastic piece of engineering. It's honestly amazing what they can do, how many things uh, that they think about on your behalf, which just means that 99.9% .9 of the time, even if you care about performance deeply, you just write sensible, easy to understand code and defer to the compiler to make the right decisions. Now, there are times when that's not true in that 0.01% of the time, but most of the time, write clear code, the compiler's got you. And I'm hopefully going to show you that that's the case with some of these examples that I'm giving you. And you can kind of get an appreciation for the kinds of things a compiler is doing for you every time you hit make. So what is a compiler to me? Um, so when I first started out, as Klaus said, I started out as uh, a games programmer. And so a compiler was just a way of taking a whole bunch of text that I'd written and turning it into a console game, right? That's what I thought about the compiler. It was a means to an end. Later on, I got into sort of the template metaprogramming and, and um, more um, powerful constructs and enjoying the programming for the sake of programming. And I found that the compiler was a great um, program to take um, my beautiful template metaprogramming code like this on the left-hand side and turn it into hundreds of thousands of warnings and error messages that were hard to understand. I've gotten better at that and compilers have gotten better too. And nowadays, really, I think of a, a compiler as a way of taking sensible, idiomatic C++ code that I've written and turn it into poetic, beautiful assembly code that is efficient and uh, is extremely tailored to the, 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 the situation that I'm running it in, be it um, the particular operating system or architecture I'm targeting. And I don't generally have to think about that as much. And I would like to say like the assembly code is beautiful. Um, it is a poetry and I'd like for you to think about it like poetry and so if you're like me, um, I sort of skipped poetry reading um, uh, when I was growing up. And I realized that the way to understand and enjoy poetry is to not understand absolutely everything word for word, but to let my eyes kind of run across the poetry and pick up the feeling and the intent from the poetry rather than the specific exact uh, nature of every single word. And that's the kind of relationship I think every programmer who's writing in C++ should have with the assembly code that their compiler generates. No one should need to write assembly, or very few people should need to write assembly. Nobody needs to be able to explain every single last detail of the assembly code, but you should be able to look at it, and it should look familiar enough for you to understand roughly what's going on. So yes, assembly. Um, oftentimes, when I speak to certainly junior programmers who haven't had experience of assembly code before, when I bring up the show disassembly view in Visual Studio, or when I um, disassemble the code and start looking at it, you know, this is all pre-Compiler Explorer, their eyes would gla glaze over as if I had just handed them some kind of uh, black speech from, from Lord of the Rings and expected them to understand it. And I really don't think it needs to be that way. So I'm going to spend a very, very quick couple of minutes trying to get the basics of assembly over so that the examples I show later will make more sense. 
Although, hopefully, as I show the examples, I'll be explaining enough of what's going on for you to pick up anything that you miss. So don't feel that you have to understand everything. This is going to be very, very quick. I'm talking about x86-64 assembly, which is what most servers are written on. Uh, sorry, uh, most servers run these days is 64-bit x86 Intel. Uh, there is, of course, a lot of other CPUs out there, um, no, most notably ARM processors. And of course, the assembly code is very closely tied to the architecture that you're um, targeting. So this is going to be x86 based. There are different but equivalent uh, aspects to ARM assembly and MIPS assembly and RISC-V and all those kinds of things. But this is going to be th viewed through the lens of x86. So if you aren't working in x86 land, at least you'll get the idea that these are the kind of tricks that compilers can do for you. There are, as I say, equivalents for the others. So in general, an x86 instruction has, and in fact for ARM as well, the instruction name on the far left, and then a list of operands which are gonna be acted upon. You can think of it like a function call with the parameters to the function call being passed as like comma separated, but they, these functions are super, super simple. So an example of a function that takes no arguments uh, an instruction that takes no arguments is ret, which just means return. That's the end of a function. Uh, single argument um, instruction, would an example would be inc racks. And we'll talk all about what racks is and other things. But it means increment whatever racks is. So there's just one um, operand and it is sort of uh, modified in place. So that's the same as racks plus plus. Uh, we can move values around. and pet peeve of mine is that the assembly instructions have always called this moving. It's not like we're moving values and just copying them, but ignore that for now. Um, so like this mov edx comma one, two, three, four, oh, I've got a mouse I can highlight, can't I? Um, is literally move the value one, two, three, four into whatever edx is. Uh, another two operand thing would be add rsi comma rdi. And now this is a peculiarity of x86. Many of the instructions in x86 that you would think would be of the form x equals operand, sorry, x equals a operand b aren't actually. There's, there isn't like a three operand version. They're all two, which means that they're all in place. So an add, for example, is really a plus equals and a subtract is a minus equals and a multiply is a times equals, that kind of feel. So that means there isn't a separate output for the result. In this instance, this add RSI comma RDI is the same as RSI plus equals RDI. And that has some strange side effects that the compiler has to work around. Um, we'll look at some of those as we go. Some of the very modern instructions, like the vector parallel instructions, do actually have three operand versions. So this last example here is like a, a, a complicated vectorized add where YMM1 actually is equal to YMM2 plus YMM0. These are some of the instructions that you'll see. And in fact, these are the top 20 instructions. I wrote a program to sample randomly where the program counter was across my entire operating system. And I ran a whole bunch of stuff and I picked the top 20 instructions. And so these are the ones you're most likely going to see. Uh, they, they're broadly grouped like this. And I'm just gonna go through very quickly. Uh, things for moving data around. So MOV moves data around. Uh, it can move a constant into a register or it can move a, a, a register into memory. It can move memory into a register. And it can do zero extension and sign extension for dealing with types, um, signed or unsigned types. Um, there's also this LEA, which we'll get to. It's a complicated um, instruction to get your head around, but it's actually quite simple. And the compiler loves to admit it, so you're going to see it a lot. Uh, we've got for um, moving around in our code, we've got call and ret. So call is to call a function, and ret is to return from a function. Jump is an unconditional jump. Stack manip manipulation to push and pop. Testing and um, uh, uh, conditional branching, compare and test, which are very similar. And then jump if equal and jump if not equal. Obviously, there are loads of other jump if, jump if greater, jump if less. But in my sample, we only saw if equal or not equal. And then finally, we get to some instructions that actually do things. And those are arithmetic operations and exclusive or add, subtract, and shift. So interestingly, at least in the top 20 instructions here, there's no multiplies or divides or other th uh, like unusual or things that probably you are doing a lot in your code. They're mostly shifts and adds and exclusive ors, which is surprising. Um, we'll see why exclusive or has appeared on the list again when we get a bit down the line. And obviously, there are thousands more of instructions like this. 
um, there's like seven volumes of uh, Intel manuals that go into all the other instructions. But to a first approximation, these are all you'll see. And then for everything else, you can Google it because that's what I do. Let's talk about those operands. I've waved my hands a couple of times over them. The operands can be either a register, a, a constant, or a, a reference to memory. And again, this is now an x86 specific thing. The fact that there isn't um, a specific load or store instruction in x86, most operands can be themselves references to memory, which is, which is an interesting design and one of the things that sets x86 as being a very complicated instruction set computer. So when we're referring to memory and we want to read from it, we have to say how big an area of memory we're reading. Are we reading a byte or a 16-bit value or a 32-bit value or a 64-bit value or more? Um, and then we have to say what address we want to read. And that address can either be just a register, which is like reading through a pointer, or it can be a register plus a constant offset. And that allows us to index into, say, a structure. If you've got a pointer to the beginning of a structure and you want to get a, a, an, an element of that structure that's like 16 bytes in, the compiler can generate a, a register plus 16. But there's also like a kind of array uh, indexing mode where you can have a register plus an offset plus another register multiplied by either one, two, four, or eight, which allows us to sort of step through an array and read the every byte or every two bytes or every four bytes um, by using an index to offset it. And typically the compiler doesn't use it for this and we'll see what it does use it for in a minute, but it's quite a complicated way of, of the compiler saying, sorry, of this, the CPU being able to express which memory address you want to read from. And remember, this is just a side effect of an instruction. So actually, a, a, a whole instruction might look something like this, where we're saying EAX plus equals this complicated expression of like RDI plus 12 plus RSI times four, read the memory address that's there. So that's really quite a complicated instruction. I think you'll agree. And don't worry, you don't see this level of complexity very often in the instruction. So what are these registers? I keep talking about registers. And um, it's really important just to know a few things about the registers. They have many different names. Um, the ones you'll see most often are the R prefix names. And the R prefix names are 64-bit wides. And RAX um, is the like accumulator register. It's the one that was uh, originally in the, the, the 8088, I think. Um, and it's been repurposed over and over again. And the most important thing from this slide to take home is, is what the conventions are for what values go into what registers. So typically when you call a function, the function takes parameters and the way you communicate to the function that you're calling which parameters uh, to pass is that you put the parameters in RDI for the first parameter, RSI for the second parameter, RDX for the third and so on. There's a whole list of them. Um, but if you've got more than three parameters to a function, you probably shouldn't be staring at the assembly code too much. Um, and then if that function returns a value, the expectation is that function will leave the value in the RAX register. And um, then there are a whole bunch of other uh, instructions, RBX, RCX, and then um, they've got a board of uh, complicated letter-based names and just decided when AMD extended the extensions, uh, the, the register set to call them R8 through R15, which is a lot more pleasing. Uh, these XMM, YMM, and ZMM registers are all multimedia, very, very wide uh, um, instruct uh, registers. And they're used typically for floating point operations or packed SIMD stuff, which we'll talk about towards the end of this presentation. So that's what registers are. It's worth knowing that, again, another sort of strange x86 quirk is that you can refer to the same register, the same area of, of the register file, with many different names. And that selects whether it's this whole 64 bits. So if you call, call the RAX register RAX, you mean all 64 bits of it. If you call it EAX, you're only looking at the bottom 32 bits call it AX, you're looking at the bottom 16 bits. And if you call it AL, you're only looking at the bottom byte of that whole 64-bit register. And actually, this is kind of like a, one of those rock strata diagrams where you the, the lower down you go in the strata, the, the further back in time you're looking, because that AL down there is actually very closely related to the original 8088 um, uh, A register, like I was saying before. <clears throat> OK, so that's basically what instructions look like. And again, I'm not expecting everyone to just go, oh, I, I get it now. Hopefully, as we go through some practical examples, you'll get the gist of what I'm talking about. But if you're looking at assembly, you're usually thinking about performance. And I would just want to say that 
reading assembly code alone is no substitute to proper benchmarking, be it through micro benchmarking libraries like Google Benchmark or your own application specific benchmarks. I would encourage you very strongly to, before you make too many decisions based on just reading the assembly output, benchmarking before and after. And it's really hard to benchmark well. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure there is a good general purpose way of doing it, but you should definitely be aware that just the number of instructions that you see in the output of Compiler Explorer is not a good proxy for how fast something is going to run. And we'll actually see that in a second. OK, that's enough of the background. I'm just going to quickly look over uh, some questions already in here. Uh, how are structures passed by value? So that's very specific to the ABI. Um, my understanding is that for a structure that can fit into a register, the first parameter can be squished into one single register. So if your entire structure is passed, um, is less than 64 bits, it can be squeezed into the racks register. I think the second and third parameters that are being passed along if they're passed as structures or if they're structures that are too big are actually put on the stack and copied onto the stack um, and then uh, a reference is passed to it instead. Um, but I'm not 100% certain on that. But I, it, typically, I don't look at large structures being passed like that way. Um, OK. I think I've caught up some of these. Yes, right. So let's talk about the tip bits then. This is where it gets interesting. So we're going to start early. Uh, start early. Start simply. <laughs> And we're going to start with just some very simple math, or maths, as I would normally say. Of it, this is slides that um, are international. So, I'm going to start with a very, very simple uh, test function that takes an x and a y as two integers and returns x minus y. And we're going to look at it in Compiler Explorer. So, um, I'm hoping that that is big enough for the stream. But now I'm wondering, it maybe isn't. I'm going to just bump up the size a couple of. Things. There we are. That looks okay. I'm now looking at the sort of delayed Twitch stream to make sure that that is somewhat readable. Okay. So let's just take a look with our understanding of uh, now what's going on. Um, so I am using GCC 8.2, which is a relatively old GCC, but um, I understand the code that it generates pretty well. I don't expect that newer GCCs or Clangs would generate too much different code. Um, we will see some comparisons down the line. I'm using dash O2 because on O3, oftentimes, the compiler generates loads of really, really clever code, and that's just too much to go into. But we will look at a couple of examples. I am targeting the Haswell architecture. I find that if you can guarantee your sort of minimum CPU, then it's useful to be able to specify it because the compiler gets more freedom in picking some of the newer cool instructions that are available to it. And then I've turned on all the warnings and pedantic just so that it's keeping me honest and I'm not doing too many things that aren't actually valid C. But I think with this example, we're pretty um, pretty safe. So our function test takes two parameters and returns one. So we know that the answer is going to be put into EAX. So that's our, as, as the function's responsibility is to make sure that, that X minus Y ends up in EAX. And then the caller has arranged for RDI to contain the uh, x parameter and rsi to contain the y parameter. OK, I said rdi and rsi. But as you can see over on the right hand side here, the e suffixes are used, eax, edi, uh, and esi. And that's because these integers are only 32 bits long. So we're only going to look at the bottom 32 bits. So um, the e prefix is used. So the first thing that happens is that it copies our um, first parameter. This is copying x into eax. So this is, um, it's worth saying as well, uh, in Intel syntax, the destination is always on the left-hand side. So this is the destination here. The EAX is the destination. And we're putting EDI into EAX. And then we're doing EAX minus equals ESI. So this is kind of the equivalent of me going, uh, you know, uh, auto EAX equals X. And then saying EAX minus equals Y. And then, of course, EX is whatever we return is the end. So that's that's what the compiler has had to do here. And you'll see that it's had to use two instructions for what a thing that you would otherwise imagine might be a single instruction. And that's because we have to move the results from the uh, RSI and RDI registers they're in into EAX somehow. We can't just do that in one go. So that's um, x minus y. And you might be reason, you might think if I were to change this into a plus, all that we would see is this sub over here would become an add. 
But that's not what happened. So let's start down that road. I'm going to do x plus y instead. And now straight away, we're seeing something unusual happening. Um, gone are the e prefixes. These are now r's. This lea instruction has come along. And there is only one instruction now. So the compiler has done something very clever here. So let me talk to you about what that LEA instruction really is. LEA stands for Load Effective Address. And what it says is, I would like to do the complicated memory um, computation that happens when normally I'm accessing memory. If you remember, when you access memory on the next 86, you can use this base plus an offset plus another register times one, two, four, or eight. And it says, do that work as if you were going to read memory, but don't read the memory. Give me the address instead. Now, why would it do this? The answer is, this allows it to put the result in a different register from the two source operands. This is its way of backdooring in um, a, a, uh, an add and putting it into an e, uh, into a different destination. You remember the previous thing, we had to like move into EAX first and then do the subtraction because it's a minus equals. The same would be true of a plus. It would have to do a plus equals. So here the LEA does the addition of the two um, uh, values and puts the results in EAX. Now, you might be thinking, but RDI and RSI aren't pointers. How can I do this? Well, surely this is going to cause a seg fault. But no memory access is done here. And so what I was, I was actually experimenting with this uh, just before we came on. This is equivalent to the code of return the address of, let's assume, let's cast x to be a char star, which is horrible, never do this, um, y. So that's like saying, give me the address of, assuming x was a pointer, the yth element of the char array at x which we know is awful. You can't do this. You can't form pointers that way. You shouldn't do heinous um, pointer casting like that. But that's what it's doing behind the scenes. And it's doing that because it can get away with using an instruction that saves one whole cycle. And it's worth it to a compiler. Now, you wouldn't want to write your code this way, but the compiler can certainly write it for you. So let's um, let's do something more complicated. I'm going to get rid of the, the Y parameter here. And I'm just going to, first of all, do return X. And you can see that one instruction is needed to move the, the input parameter to the output. So let's think about some other things that you might commonly do. Let's let's multiply by uh, a number, and I, I'm going to say 8. And what we immediately see is that it can still use that LEA instruction. Um, in this instance, um, it's using an offset of 0 plus RDI times 8. Remember, it can multiply one of the two operands in this uh, memory uh, uh, access by one, two, four, or eight. So if I use one, two, four, or eight, or one's no point, but if I use two here, you can see it's going to use an, uh, a different thing. Oh, it actually uses RDI plus RDI. It uses um, a register plus itself. That's interesting. And four, now we're going to get the zero plus RDI times four. Now, you might think if it's not a power of two, if it's not one, two, four, or eight, something awful is going to have to happen. But let's have a look at what multiplying by three does. Multiplying by 3 says, well, multiplying by the 3 is the same as taking x and adding x times 2 to it. So this is what's happening here. We're doing x plus x times 2. And all of this is just happening for free in every single multiply you ever do in your code. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, obviously, we can get arbitrarily complicated. If I do 9, it can still do it because it's 9 is 8 plus 1. What about 12? OK, now 12, it's doing something more clever. It's saying, um, what is this? This is uh, this is times 3, and then um, shifting it right 2 times. So shifting it right 2 times is the same as multiplying by 4. So all this, this stuff is going on behind the scenes for you every time you just write a simple multiply, and that's great. And if you think, I don't write integer multiplies all that often, just think how often you're writing references um, to structures in arrays, and you want to get the nth element out, you're going to have to do some kind of multiply by the size of that structure. So it happens a lot. Uh, so why can't G++ use the LEA for the, uh, for the uh, subtraction was one of the questions. Um, the LEA can only do addition because it's only designed for adding offsets to pointers. So we can't use it for doing subtraction. It would take an, uh, a, a an instruction to negate one of the inputs, first of all, and then it could LEA with a plus. And at that point, it nets out, and it might as well just use a subtract. Uh, OK. 
And uh, thank you, Klaus, for, for putting a great link to how structures are passed, probably um, much more clear than anything I said earlier. So multiplying by 12, but let's just pick a big old uh, random number, 65599. Okay, and now finally, for the very first time, the compiler has actually done the thing I specifically asked it to do, which is to say, I would like to take EDI, multiply it by 65599, and put the result in EAX. And as it happens in this particular form of IMOL, this multiply instruction, integer multiply instruction, this is a three operand instruction. And so I can get the result into the register that I want. Now, back in the day when I used to write video games, you would look at something like that and go, multiplies are slow. I know this because multiplies are a multi-cycle instruction, whereas adds and shifts are usually a single cycle. I bet I can write a sequence of shifts and adds myself that will beat this because you know I know better than the compiler. So I'm going to go back to my slides. And this indeed is what such a function might look like. I'm observing that 65,599 is 65536 plus 64 minus 1. So I've got this. I can combine and these shifted values and say that a times 65536 plus a times 64 minus a is the same as 65599 lots of a. And that is bound to be faster because these are only shifts and adds, right? Shifts, usually single cycle, adds single cycle too. So let's go and see what happens if we put it into Compiler Explorer. So this was a huge surprise to me when I first tried this out. And it made me laugh because the compiler has saved me from myself. So for those who are uh, still like catching up here, the compiler has seen my sequence of shifts and adds and it is determined that this is equivalent to multiplying by 65,599. And so that's what it's done for me. Because the compiler knows that actually this multiply instruction is faster than the equivalent sequence of shifts and adds, right? My information is out of date. Um, as my you know 20-year-old video game programmer mentality has not kept up with the performance of every, every single instruction. And so just trust your compiler, write multiply by 65599 if you meant multiply by 65599. Don't try these tricks. They're not worth it anymore. Um, moreover, as you change, and I haven't got time for it now, but as you change the architecture, and if you even go back to like old Pentiums and target those, the compiler will generate those adds and shifts for me when it is profitable to do so. So the short answer is trust your compiler. Uh, does as people are asking about LEA perform overflows correctly? Well, interestingly, I was using signed adds there, X plus Y, right? If I use uh, int X and int Y, signed overflow is undefined behavior. So the compiler can actually use an LEA. It doesn't care. It doesn't mind what happens because you're not supposed to allow it to overflow. And that's one of those cases where UB is useful for the compiler. It can make these assumptions because the values coming in are, um, uh, are, are assigned. And we could actually quickly go and experiment. Oh, this is this is how I get off topic, uh, not off topic, but off uh, off base. What happens if I were to make these unsigned? So let's get back to x plus y, which uses an LEA, and then we do unsigned, unsigned. It can still use it. Why is that? Uh, of course, um, by writing to the EAX register, we're truncating to the bottom 32 bits. So the the overflow here, just the, the top 32 bits get clipped off. So we're actually fine in this case too. All right, again, so as not to get totally derailed, I will uh, I will plow on, otherwise we'll be here forever. Now, we're gonna move on to some division. And uh, how many times have you seen code like this? I've seen people do this. I used to do this all the time, right? I just know that I'm dividing by a power of two, so I'll shift down by the relevant amount instead of using a divide. And you know, if we look at this, and as my comment says, I clearly can't trust the compiler to do this. And, um, you know, Obviously, when I when I shift it down, it has to do a shift. That's fine. Um, because if I were to just do divide by 16 in the naive way, let me just comment that out and do return oops, uh, a over 16, look at how much code the compiler generated. It did use a shift, but there's all these other things here which I don't care about. What on earth is going on there? And the answer that the compiler is generating more code than my shift here is because my code is broken. Don't do that. My code doesn't work properly for negative numbers. And we can easily sort of see that, right? If I do const uh, uh, auto x equals a divided by 4, I think you'll agree that if you divide 
Oh, A, sorry, no. Let me just put that in. Divide by 16 of 4. Nope, 26. My keyboard is just out of reach for me here. Um, <clears throat> well, I suppose I have to make it not constant, otherwise it gets killed by the command. There we are. Okay. So um, it's putting the value 0 into that constant because 4 divided by 16 rounds to 0, I think you'll agree. Minus 4 should also round to zero. C says that we should round towards zero. My broken code, if I replace this in instead, says that minus four divided by 16 is minus one. And so the compiler is saving me from myself. This is a mistake. This is not a divide by 16. This is a sort of divide by 16 rounding to negative infinity, which is like maybe what you want, but probably not. So again, trust the compiler to do the right thing for you. And if you want the right answer here, if you want this code to not have all of this accounting for negative numbers, and you just happen to know that your code actually only does use unsigned numbers, tell it, tell the compiler, hey, if I have an unsigned int there, now it generates the same code that my original code did. But it's correct, right? The type system has given the compiler the information it needs to make the right decision. So tell the compiler um, the right things and give it all the information it can to generate the right kind of code. Uh, I'm actually going to skip this summary example because I want to get to some more um, cool stuff and I'm going slower than I expected, uh, which is on me. Uh, so I'm going to skip over this, but the compiler is really clever at, gener at looking at loops and basically replacing the loop with a single uh, closed form solution to things like um, sum all the integers from 1 through n. And that's super cool. Let's talk about vectorization. So vectorization is takes advantage of the fact that CPUs do an awful lot of work to get the instructions lined up. And once the instructions are ready to be executed, the actual bit where you are doing the adds or the subtracts or the multiplies is relatively cheap and um, uh, cheap in terms of silicon. And so if you can arrange for four pieces of data that need to be added independently, you can do those all together as and, and with very little extra cost compared to the silicon for just having one. And so vectorization is the, trying to line up pieces of work to put into wide registers, which are usually divided into little compartments, either four or eight compartments, and then doing operations on those compartments um, together so that like all of the, the eight doubles that are in one register get multiplied with the eight doubles in another register, giving you eight more results of all the intermediate bits and pieces. So let's look at um, a relatively straightforward thing. So maybe you're doing um, some kind of uh, root mean square um, operation. You know, you've got some uh, audio files or some other thing, and you want to get the root mean square to kind of work out how um, loud something is. And you've got a vector of integers containing your samples. And the first thing you need to do is get the sum of the squares. And you might write something like this. And you just start with you know a result of 0. And you say, for all the elements in the vector, the result is plus equal to i squared return result. So let's go and have a look at what happens with that. So on O2, on dash O2, that is not turning the compiler onto its full power, the code that it generates is actually very straightforward. I'd realize that's a, a relative term here. Let's take a little bit of time to go over this so that you get a feel for what it looks like to be passed um, a more complicated object like a, a vector. So the first thing to note is that we have one parameter to our function, so it will be in RDI, and that parameter is a reference to a vector of integers. A reference is a pointer as far as the hardware is concerned. There is no difference between them. So what RDI is, is a pointer to the vector object. It is not a pointer to the first integer in an array. It is a pointer to the object that then holds the information about the vector. And it just so happens that the vector object has a few pointers inside of it. It has a pointer to the first element of the array, it has a pointer to the last element of the array, and it also has a pointer to the end of the storage, but we don't need to worry about that. So if we look on the right-hand side here, RDI, remember, is our pointer to that vector. The first thing we're doing is we're moving uh, RCX and R RSI as the first two pointer structures inside the vector. And it just so happens that sensibly, the vector has the begin pointer first, and then it has the end pointer second. So here we're reading begin, and here we're reading end of the vector. We're then exclusive oring EAX with itself. 
Now, if you recall right back to the slides where I gave you a list of all of the instructions and I said, hey, why is exclusive or on there? This is why. It turns out that the most efficient way to set a register to zero for a bunch of reasons is to exclusive or it with itself. Because if you take this, a number and exclusive or, the, or it with itself, you always get zero. So this is a zeroing idiom. And if I had more time, we could go on forever about how cool that is and why that's the case. But Zor EAX EAX is the same, like the color highlighting in the background. You know, this has got a blue highlight, and so is the line over here, int res equals zero. This says that this is set result to zero. And you can see that the compiler has decided to use the EAX register to hold this res intermediate value because it knows that right at the end of the function, it's going to be returning res anyway. So it might as well kind of line things up ready for that. The next thing we do is we say is begin, this RCX, equal to end. And if it is, we're finished, right? We've got zero in our result and we just jump over here to L4, which is a return instruction. So if the empty, if the vector was empty, we've, we're finished. Otherwise there's at least one integer in the vector. And so we're gonna read that vector, sorry, we're going to read that integer out of the vector pointer. We're gonna move our pointer forwards so here, for example, um, you might be thinking that this is doing some kind of loop where it's adding an index each time, but it isn't. Remember, if you're doing um, uh, a range for, you're really doing a begin and end, and you're doing uh, an iterator plus plus until you hit the end, and that's what the compiler is doing for you here. Uh, so this is it moving the 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 uh, iterator that's sort of hiding it away in that range for forward. It's then squaring the number that it read and adding it to the running total and say, hey, have we got to the end? If not, go back to L3. And then when we're finished, the result is there. So the thing that I tend to zone in on is not all of this fluff. I know I've gone, been through every single instruction in this particular example, but I'm gonna stop doing that now because we don't have time and it's not necessary. What I'm drawn to is I look for the loop. If there's a small piece of code and there's a loop in it, that's likely to be where most of the time is going to be spent. And so I just scan down until I find one of these references backwards and I go, oh, that must be the loop here, this JNEL3. So these instructions here are the ones that are gonna run for every single iteration of the, <coughs> oh, excuse me, every single iteration of the, uh, of the loop, which is to say for every single integer in the vector. So if there's a thousand entries in that vector, this is gonna run a thousand times. So that's clearly where the time is going to be spent. Um, so no vectorization has happened here. If I allow it to, uh, let me just turn on F loop tree vectorize. Is that the right thing? I should have remembered this. No, oh, all right, I'm just gonna put it on 03. So this may actually change something. Let me put it on 03. But this is one of the reasons why I don't just put 03 on all of my examples. If I just scroll down here, you can see the sheer amount of code that's been generated has gone up a hundred fold. So I'm not going to go into this in any detail at all but I'm gonna show you the loop part again. So I'm gonna skim down and I'm gonna look for the, the loop. And here it is, the L4 thing here. I can see the backwards jump and you know a, a small number of instructions in the middle. And um, again, I'm not gonna go into too, too much detail, but let's just have a look at what's happening. Now, whenever we are moving um, the pointer forward, so this is our pointer where we're picking up um, an integer from our vector, we're moving 32 bytes at a time, which means that we're running eight integers at once, right? This loop here is only running for every eight integers. And that must be a huge improvement in speed, right? We're picking up eight at a time. We are multiplying those eight with themselves. So we're squaring the eight individual um, things we picked up, and then we're summing them up um, eight at a time as well. And then we go, go back around in a loop. So now you know, we've got the same number of instructions that we had in our single case, but we're doing eight at a time. And that's an amazing speed up. Now there are some caveats with this as there always are, right? This is automatically vectorized my, my loop, but there's a bunch of extra code here that I wave my hands over. And there's a bunch of extra code up here and there's a ton down the bottom. So there are some costs to setting this up. And uh, I'll show you what they are if we go back. <clears throat> so what the compiler has done is that it has decided to do eight at a time, it's gonna read eight integers, it's gonna square eight integers, and then it needs to sum eight integers, but it can't sum them with each other. It can only sum them with their equivalent in another register. And so what it's going to do is it's going to sum eight individual subtotals. So in its hot loop, it's keeping eight individual subtotals. And this is what the hot loop's like for everything, go eight at a time, and then 
square up the vowels and and add each of them individually to the their eight individual subtotals except that i have to write that as a loop here but that's actually happens in the in silicon as a single instruction and then when we finish going over the entire um array of integers we now have to sum up all of those subtitles sorry subtitles subtotals to get the final grand total so there's a couple of things going on here that are quite amazing first of all the cpu can do this that's great the second thing is the compiler can take my linear code that was written using a range for and turn it into this completely different way of summing numbers it's totally changed my code which i think is amazing and obviously it can be a lot faster now I haven't read that I'm going to catch up with the, the the questions in a second, but obviously, what happens if there aren't eight of them? What happens if there are less than eight? What happens if there are um, um, not a multiple of eight? There's a lot of other things that has to happen, which is what a lot of that extra code, both above and below, was handling was all the edge cases where you haven't got eight to 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 do in the first place. But if you know that your loop is a multiple of eight, or it's going to be be a um, uh, big enough that the little cost of doing the two or three stragglers at the end is, is small, then this is a great thing for the compiler to do for you. All right, I'm just gonna quickly catch up on these things. Looks like we are, uh, yes, so they're just things to talk about at the end. And of course, I'll be hanging around for a bit longer in the, the meetup, uh, sorry, the Zoom at the end to uh, answer any questions. Um, so I, I'll keep on plowing on. The other cool thing, about this, uh, uh, the compiler's ability to rewrite my code is that I can actually write it in you know more modern C++ style. So here I'm using standard accumulate, using the begin and the end, and you know start with a, a whatever t is and templatize everything, and then I'm just going to say my accumulation function is old value plus new value squared. Uh, this is templatized on t, and now if you've ever written um, template code and kind of try to coerce Compiler Explorer to generate it for you, you'll know that there isn't an easy way necessarily to do this. So I'm just going to write a function that uses a concrete particular version. So let's say, uh, you know, auto uh, x, and it takes a const uh, std vector of int v, and it returns some squared of v. This is only for purely for Compiler Explorer. Um, and what you can see is now we've, we've instantiated um, a version of this accumulation-based um, uh, code for a vector of ints and you know again it's a lot of code but the main thing is that this inner loop is exactly the same so even though we've used standard accumulate it it doesn't matter the the compiler sees through all of that and generates the same optimal code so you can feel free to use your no raw loops based code rather than my old-fashioned range for stuff and that's great of course now we've templatized this in type name t i can some things that aren't integers. And in fact, if I, my sort of example at the beginning was to say, like, what if this was a root mean square of samples? Very often your samples are going to be floating point numbers and not integers. So if I replace this with float here, we should see the same thing, right? But for floats. And unfortunately, uh, this top part hasn't changed much, but our L4 loop here has, it's grown. It's grown an awful lot. And that's very sad. Very sad indeed, because we're still doing 32 bytes worth of uh, elements, which is to say eight floats. Each float is four bytes. but um, And we're still reading them in one go, and we're still squaring them in one go. But then it gets really, really complicated. And the unfortunate answer here is that the compiler can't use the same trick it used for the integers as it does with the floats. So do you remember the compiler rewrote my code? We It took my simple sum of A plus B plus C plus D plus E for all of the values in the vector, one after another, and turned it into uh, eight separate subtotals, each individually totaled up, and then it summed them at the end. And the compiler can do that with integers because it doesn't matter. Order doesn't matter when you're adding integers. A plus B is the same as B plus A. So you could rewrite that as many times as you like. But floating point numbers are funny. And it is in general, you can't sum floating point orders in any order and get the same result. So the compiler hasn't got the, um, the, the uh, not the ability, the, hasn't got the permission to rewrite my code in the same way that it could, because it has to act as if um, my, my code was just linear one after another. Now, there is a very scary flag that I, I encourage you to not use without extremely careful um, thinking, and that is, F fast math. 
And there are some other, or yeah, there's F, F unsafe math optimizations. Of the, check your documentation to make sure you only turn on the one you like. For, for this purposes, it's just easier to turn everything on. This says, hey, compiler, I don't mind, actually. Assume all math operations are arbitrarily switch around or use approximations if that's better. Um, um, Chandler likes to call this, sorry, Chandler Caruth likes to call this the unbounded precision loss flag, which it is, right? It's effectively um, any, any kind of ordering that I may have carefully done on purpose is lost by this. But, but by turning it on, the compiler now can reorder and use that subtotal trick. And in fact, in it, two things have happened here. Now our L4 loop has shrunk back down to being smaller. And it's in fact one instruction smaller than it was before, because now we can use a, a really crazy instruction called VFM add 231 PS in this case, which is a multiply and add in one instruction. And that's great, right? It can do the squaring of YMM2 and, um, here and add it into the subtotal in one instruction. So that's super cool, but just be careful. Okay, I'm gonna go back out of that. Um, let's talk a little bit about, and let's just check the time. We're getting closer to where I am. Uh, yes, that's correct. So yeah, I've just seen uh, um, a, a comment about the operation being commutative and associative, right? And there are flags to specifically turn those things on and say, assume floats are those things, which they are not. But if, uh, if you need the speed, you probably need to do some of those things or write them yourselves. So let's go on to some things that are very specific to uh, some of the instructions that are built into most architectures, actually. Um, this is one of those questions that I ask folks, and um, and usually the kind of the setting that people have heard this kind of thing before is like in an in interview, which I encourage you to not do. Don't ask people funny questions like this in interviews. But this function is designed to say, given a value A, an unsigned value A, how many one bits are there in the binary representation of that number? That is, how many set bits have you got? And it sounds like one of those kind of trick questions that you get asked, um, but it does actually have some very useful um, things. It's used in packed matrices. It's used in some compression algorithms and things like that. So, so it, it does have value, but I just like it because it's fun. So let's have a look at it. I'll look at it actually in, in the compiler here. Um, the, the algorithm in general is say, start with a count of zero. So this is the Zori AX, the AX over here, we've been now used to. While A isn't equal to zero, you know, as soon as A is zero, we know that there are zero set bits in it. But while there are any set bits at all, and that corresponds to this test and jump, right? If, there's, if there are no set bits, then we're done. We say, well, there must be at least one set bit. So increment our count. And that again becomes this inc EAX on the other side. And then this is one of those clever little tricks that if you've grown up in the video games industry or if you've read uh, Bit Twiddling Hacks um, from Stanford's EDU or what's the other one? There's a great book on this, Hacker's Delight. Um, you'll recognize as being, this thing clears the bottom set bit. And I would encourage you to sit down. So A and equals A minus one. That is take a logical and of A and A decremented. It's a good fun thing to do. Sit down, write out a number in you know four bits of binary, uh, subtract one from it and see what the pattern looks like and then add it and you'll see why this works. It's cool, I like doing it. It's a good one to do on a whiteboard. But this essentially clears the bottom set bit. And then we go around the loop again. So if every time that there is still at least one bit set, we just clear the bottom bit and then go around again. And it turns out that this clear bottom bit set thing is so common that there is an instruction to do it and the compiler has cleverly found it. This BLSR is like bit least significant reset or something like that. Again, I can mouse over and it tells me all these things um, for those who haven't found that yet in Compiler Explorer. Um, but there's our loop. So that's pretty cool, except that I've deliberately hamstrung the compiler here. This is an older version of the compiler. This is 8.2. If I were to pick a newer version of the compiler, oh, not 8.3 apparently, 9.1, something even cleverer happens. The entire function is replaced with pop which is an instruction whose only job it is, is to say how many set bits are there. And so that's a pretty cool thing. The compiler has recognized this whole loop construct on the left-hand side, and it's replaced the whole thing with a single instruction. And that's cool. I just think it's so clever that the compilers have come on this far. And Clang was the first one to notice this for what it's worth. Um, and you, you notice that it's doing a population count, but there's also one other instruction in both cases. I think if I go to GCC trunk there, it, it has this Zori AX, EAX, which doesn't seem to make sense. Clang has a C move of itself, which is also doesn't make sense. Um, 
both Clang and GCC are working around a CPU bug here. There is a CPU bug in pop count. It's a performance bug, uh, and these are workarounds for it. And again, if we if you're interested in what the heck that's all about, we can talk about it in the chat afterwards. So that's pretty cool. Um, compilers are smart enough to take a, a, a macroscopic thing like an entire function with a loop in it and replace it with a single instruction. They're also clever enough to notice when you have to deal with like Endian problems. So uh, if any of you have ever had to deal with big Endian and little Endian things like on a network, you've probably written something like this or you've used um, htons or htonl um, from a, a, a library. The, the compiler is clever enough to notice that you are shifting each of the individual bytes of a 32-bit value and switching them around, and it will happily generate the B-swap instruction, which does exactly that, which is super cool. Um, it's also clever enough to use a load. If you're then using this in an, um, like, for example, if I have, you know, let's say UN32 load, load switched, and it takes a UN32T ah, const, have to be constant even in these, uh, adder. So this is me saying, hey, I want to switch a load something. I'm going to say return switch bits. Oh, I'm expecting my IDE completions here, and I actually did it. Adder and, oh, star adder. Never make live things. You can see that it didn't even use a B-swap instruction for this load switched. It uses the MOV BE, which is a version of the MOV instruction to read from memory that does the switch as it reads from memory. So the compilers are just super cool here. They're very, very clever. Uh, so there's a question about uh, f fast math per function. There are ways you can pragma it on and off, but I have not had much success getting that to work the way that I would like it to, because oftentimes you need the whole STL that you maybe you're using to also be compiled with f fast math. Like the compiler tracks which functions it's already seen that have had f fast math applied to them, and yeah, it's a, so translation unit is where I usually do my f fast math uh, if I need it at all. Um, or library. I have got one library where I have, uh, it's the F unsafe math optimizations, which always comes out as fun safe, which amuses me. I've got that in like one library where it's like, okay, if you're using this library and you're calling these functions, it's because you value speed over uh, correctness. So you're on your own. Uh, this is a cool trick. So again, I'm sure somewhere along the line, you've, some, you've written a parser and you, you hopefully haven't written is space because Unicode, because all the other things, because there's a version in the STL uh, or the C library. But you've written something like this, I'm sure, which is like, you know, is it a, a dot or a hyphen or a backslash or, or whatever? And I was, I, I happened to be debugging through some some code and I spotted what the, uh, the compiler had done and I was very, very impressed. So I was expecting this to be a sequence of compares and jumps. You know, is it a space? Yes. Jump to the return true. Is it a, is it a, a, a return character? Yes. Jump. Is it a new line? Is it a tab? Right. Those kinds of things. And then otherwise return false. But it isn't. It's this sweet piece of code on the right-hand side. So there's a lot of things going on in here. Um, the first thing we do is we say uh, the return value is false for a start. So zor eax eax. That means set it to zero. As we said, zero is false. We're checking dill. Dill here is the low byte of the RDI register. Remember, RDI is the first parameter. So this is dill is the name of the char that was passed in. We're saying if it is above, strictly above 32, that is 33 or greater, go to return. So obviously, for those who don't know their ASCII, space is 32 and slash R and slash n and slash t are like 10, 13, and uh, 8. Oh, I'll have to, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head now. So they're all below 32 anyway is the, is the main thing. So having done that, having said, well, if it's above, above 32, it can't be. And if I mouse over the weird constant, you can see that it is some very large 10002600. And then it shifts down that constant and ends it with 1. And so I've got, luckily, I have... This sort of written out longhand. This constant is a 33-bit lookup table encoded as a constant where the one bits are set for bits 9 and 10 being um, new line and tab, and bit 13 being return, and bit 31 being the space. And so what it's doing is it's doing a lookup in a single-bit uh, single lookup in a, in a constant. And that's a, just a really smart transformation to do. I just think it's great. Um, I was really impressed that it did this. So, um, you know, obviously it selects the seeth bit 
of this constant using the shifts. And that's the answer. And um, it's also interesting if I go back to it and choose Clang. Clang has a different strategy for doing this. So just pick Clang trunk. So Clang um, subtracts nine ahead of time and then compares with 23. So it's kind of bringing it down in, in range. And the reason for that is that now it can use a smaller constant down here. So it, it's one cycle up here that uses a smaller constant, which is less to decode. Uh, but ultimately, it's the same kind of pattern. And I just think that's great that the compilers are using the same kind of tricks in different ways. And so you get a different thing from each compiler. It's always worth compiling your code with multiple compilers if you can afford it. OK. Uh, let's look at some things to do with the way function calls um, work. And now this is we're actually heading towards the bits that aren't so great about the compiler, or rather the things that you should be aware of before you can rely on the compiler doing certain optimizations for you. And that is, um, so here is an example of the sum up to function. Now I glossed over this before. Um, if you recall, I said this, this function adds up all the numbers between zero and x, and the compiler was able to transform that into the closed form solution of the problem without even doing a loop, which was very clever. And we'll see that actually as we do this. So, um, but in this instance, what I'm doing is I'm not summing up the values i, I'm summing up the result of calling a function called identity on i. Now, I haven't specified what identity is. I'm going to tell you that the identity just returns num in this comment here. But obviously, the compiler doesn't know that. And the compiler can't assume that. So, if we go and look at what the code looks like, we have um, a loop. And again, I'm, this is now Clang that we're looking at. So the L things are slightly different. But I'm just skimming over this. And I'm finding the loop here being this like uh, this JNE block here. And you know the loop looks like I'd expect. We have to call a function. And we have to do some manipulation and add up. And that's it. We're summing these things up. And that, that's kind of what you'd expect. Now. If I just actually gave it the body of this function, so rather than my comment saying just returns num, I just return num, something magical happens. The loop goes away, and it turns it into the closed form solution that I was referring to earlier. So this, there is no loop in this output here. It's just a check to see whether or not it's 0. And if not, it does uh, you know, the equivalent of x, x plus 1 over 2, but accounting for overflow and other bits and pieces. Now, GCC doesn't do this. So if we go and pick GCC. Um, you'll see that GCC does the loop here. So here's the loop of GCC. But the, the main thing to realize is that these clever optimizations that you might otherwise be able to rely on rely on essentially inlining or the compiler knowing something about everything that's going on. And a function call is a potential barrier to knowledge for the compiler. So for example, if I now comment that back out again, our, our code grows hugely. Right? There's this, all this accounting for the stack. There's this call here. And no, none of the other optimizations that could otherwise happen in this loop can happen, because we don't know what identity does. We don't know if it affects global variables or any references of things we have to. So as long as the compiler can see that, it can make all sorts of clever optimizations, including that Clang-based one, where it, it actually makes the loop go away entirely. So that's a big, big difference. And that's why you know I think folks refer to inlining as like the mother of all optimizations. It really does unlock so many other optimizations. Now, obviously, if you put all of your code in header files, your build times go up. Maybe that's fine for you. Um, I would like short build times myself. So what I typically end up doing is a mixture of, I mean, obviously, for an identity function, I would put that in the header. And obviously, it would have to be marked in line just to make sure you don't have any multiple definition problems. But I rely on link time optimization, link time code generation, whatever you'd want to call it, to do this kind of inlining for my release builds only. So the comp I get the best of all worlds. I don't tell the compiler too much information, which leads to very close coupling between um, my, my various functions. Um, but when it comes to building my release and my, with all the optimizations turned on, I will turn on link time optimization. And this inlining can happen across translation units. But so just a sort of warning there that um, uh, a function call can be a barrier to the compiler. And there are some GCC extensions that allow you to specify certain things about functions, like functions being pure or um, being uh, constant in some other ways. But I wouldn't recommend going down that route if you can avoid it. Uh, so what if we were to replace that um, the, the known function with a, a functional call operator? So I'm just going to give it a reference to some, some function func. And it's, there's exactly one concrete implementation of it here. Um, it's going to take an x and return x. So we're going to get pretty much the same thing we had when there was a function call. 
um, like a regular function call. And we're on the, a Clang here. And again, Clang has been able to do its trick here of saying um, n, n plus 1 over 2 is fine for me. Uh, I can see that this, even though it's going through like a, a, an operator paren paren, I can still see it's just a function call still. So now, obviously, when one starts to do these kinds of things, one might think about having sort of more object-oriented ideas and say, well, OK, what if, if Funk was, was uh, virtual? All right, I'm not going to write a virtual destructor, so never write, never do this. But just adding the virtual keyword has now ballooned our code quite a lot. Because although there is an implementation of operator paren paren, it's not the only implementation necessarily of operator paren paren. And so the compiler has to do a lot of work to um, call the virtual function and it can't make any assumptions. Although there's a tantalizing sort of hint that maybe it doesn't do anything, the compiler can't act on it. And so what we're seeing here in the looping side clang is that it's doing read the V table, get the particular entry of the first V, uh, uh, first entry in the V table and call it, which is our operator paren paren because we don't have a destructor. So normally your destructor would be the first one in this list. So, um, and you know, that's kind of sad. Uh, but what can you do, right? You can't inline a virtual function, surely. Or can you? So if we go to GCC, let's pick GCC trunk. There we go. GCC trunk kind of, sort of, inlines a virtual function call. Sort of, right? Huge caveats here. So I'm going to go and find the main loop. And the loop here is the L5 to L5 down here. And you can see there's all sorts of things going on in the middle of it. But the short version here is that GCC reads out the virt virtual function table pointer. It reads out the address of the function it's going to call. And it says, what if, what if the only implementer of this operator paren paren was the func one, the one I can see? What if? Well, why don't I just take a bet? If I'm a betting compiler, and I am, I'm going to bet that most of them are going to be this. So why don't I do take the cost and the hit of, of comparing to see, am I about to call the function that I know the body of? If I am, go to L5, which just literally increments, uh, sorry, the increment, that's the loop count a bit, um, just adds EAX to our accumulator. So it could, it's in line, the virtual function call. There is no call to this function. It just says, if it is that function, do what the body of that function does. Otherwise, it falls through into the code that then goes through the, through the polymorphic um, uh, code and calls through to an unknown function. And so this is the beginnings of something pretty exciting for me. I'd like to be able to use this kind of pattern more often, where I know ahead of time that there are very few implementations of a virtual function. Maybe there's none. Maybe it's only for testing that I need an, a point to put a virtual function call in. And then I'd love to be able to count on my compiler saying, well, there is. A, I can only see the one implementation of your file system interface. Maybe that's the one I'm going to assume it is and inline it as if it is with, with just some, some sort of like very um, slower code to deal with the, the, the case when it isn't um, that particular implementation. Now, if you're paying full attention here, you can probably see that the loop is loading the same thing and comparing the same thing over and over and over again. And there are reasons for that that I haven't got time to go into, but I believe that Clang is certainly working on uh, improvements in this particular regard to um, basically assume that the, the the dynamic type of funk can't change within the loop. Um, but I'm excited about that anyway. I think, yeah. Uh, Profile guarded optimization, maybe do something, some of this stuff as well. Yeah, I haven't played too much with PGO. Obviously, PGO is something I can't show in Compiler Explorer. Uh, cool. Okay, I have actually been somewhat on time ish. Sorry, Klaus. Um, I know you've said it's fine. And I, obviously, if people have uh, um, further questions, I can take them in the, the, the meetup afterwards. But we've gotten to the end of the, the examples that I had prepared anyway. And hopefully, you've got some questions that will cause us to write some new ones. But the conclusion really is this this is the bit you need to know. Compilers are cleverer than we are. If they've got the right information, if you've told them something's signed and you, you know it's unsigned, then it's, sometimes it's worth saying what type it is. It's a bit dangerous to give that advice in general because I know that, that some of the defaults are wrong and UB is a scary, scary thing. Um, assembly hopefully isn't that scary. Um, hopefully the examples we've gone over here have given you enough to kind of feel confident that sort of 
scrolling down and looking side by side and getting the gist of what's going on, even if you don't understand the, exactly what's going on at each step. Um, it's I think also, you know, um, trust your compiler. And my personal thing is just unless you can absolutely unconditionally prove it beyond any reasonable doubt, don't compromise readability. It's so tempting to do the heroics. You know, you remember, remember my multiply by 65599, right? That was old me who would do that kind of stuff in and would almost treat it as a badge of honor that my code was unreadable. That's a terrible example. Don't do that. Um, trust your compiler to take readable, clear code that you can reason about. Turns out if you can reason about it, the compiler can reason about it and it can do the right thing. Do be aware of compiler limitations in terms of visibility. And when I say visibility, I mean like, for example, that uh, identity function that the compiler couldn't see the body of. You know, it, it's not a mind reader. It can't infer much about a, a, a function call that it can't see the body of. There's some issues to do with aliasing that I've taken out of this talk because it was already too long. So be aware that aliasing exists, type-based aliasing. And in particular, if you're passing multiple pointers to like ints in a function or um, then you can have some fun side effects. Um, and uh, I think you know where Compiler Explorer is. Thank you so much for listening. And um, I always like to sort of say thanks to the community of people that helped me on Compiler Explorer. It's definitely not just me. There's a whole bunch of, of folks who, who've set, pull, send pull requests. And um, uh, I'm always very, very grateful to them. And obviously, if you're interested in changing Compiler Explorer, it's open source. Please come help us. We have a Discord. Come chat with us. And uh, thank you. Um, go read some assembly. So thanks a lot for the talk, Matt. Um, that was great. And you def you've definitely proven that you're not just a verb. But you've also proven definitely that um, that you are the expert that people say. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I think you answered basically all the questions that, um, that were on the chat. Or if you missed the small one, then we have already answered them um, ourselves or people were chatting about this. So I think we're fine here. But I believe there's indeed a couple of questions that would be reasonably answered in the Zoom after talk chat. We've just posted a link. And so if you want to join us, if you have a couple of questions for Matt in person, um, and if you just want to chat about C++ in general, then please join us. Also, per uh, per uh, absolutely for free. Yeah, there, there's also no pressure to ask questions. You can also just listen in. We're very ha happy to have you. Then thanks again, Matt, for the great talk. And we see each other uh, in just a couple of seconds in the Zoom after the talk chat. So bye.